Today, I'm still going to talk a little about Christmas. I'm a Christmas freak. I hate to let it go because it's such a good time of year to remember the glory of Jesus who came to us to save us. Today, the title of my message is, You Are My Son, from Psalm 2, 1 through 9. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs and the Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying... I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession, and you will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we look at these verses, we thank you that you have sent your Son into the world to save us, and he's now been installed on Mount Zion's holy hill. We ask you, dear Heavenly Father, to show us how to live for you in every part of our life, to continue to do the things you want us to do and continue to grow and be strong. We thank you for the glory of your word. Show us how to read it and study it and to know the will for us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Why did God send his son into the world, especially as a baby? Later to be the grown glory of God lifted high on a cross. Well, there's many reasons. Uh, First off, we see the nations there in uh, Psalm 2 are rebelling against the Lord. Is that happening today? The nations are rebelling against the Lord. But let me give you the real answer. The answer, my friends, is not just blowing in the wind, as the song used to say. When I was growing up, it says, and I can quote it, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Notice, we must believe in him or perish. He sent his son into the world to say, all right, kings, you've got two choices. You can end up in hell or you can believe in my son, but you cannot go against me in anger and try to throw off the fetters, for I am God. I am in charge. My son has the holy scepter that is the scepter of power, and you cannot usurp that power because you are not God. What a glorious God we have. The world has been revolting since the creation. Adam and Eve in the garden started revolt. Oh, we want to eat of that tree, and today it's everybody wants to eat of that tree that is forbidden. They want to do what they want. But my friends, the problem we need we have today is we must stop saying I want to do it my way and it is time to stand up and say God, I want to do it your way. Cuz I guarantee you when we start doing it God's way, we will have a blessing like we have never seen before. We start doing it God's way and maybe we'd have to add on to this building. We start doing it God's way, and life will treat us as God wants us. Now, it doesn't mean all things are going to be rosy. We're to pray in all circumstances, not pray for the good circumstances. When things are not going well, we need to pray for the things that are bad and thank God that we still have a Savior, Jesus Christ, enshrined upon Mount Zion. What a glorious God we have. History has shown that once a school 
or a church compromises its position and sells short the fundamental doctrines of the word, that there is no chance <clears throat> of the going back to retrieve that which they have originally adhered to. Not in one instance has there been an apostate body that returned to fundamentalism. I can prove that. Look at our colleges today. At one point, someone said there was like 280 colleges in the United States that were based on Christian principles. I can name a few of them that might surprise you. Princeton, Harvard, as well as Yale were all initially started on Christian principles. But are they on Christian principles today? Look at our government. It was started as one nation under God. And today it's one nation against God. Today it's one nation who abhors the fact that there's a church somewhere and it wants to get rid of that church and says, let's make some laws and regulations that keep them either in the building or shut them up altogether. Now I know from Hebrews chapter 6 that it says once... We leave God and go back to the world. We are crucifying Christ all over again. That's what's happening in the world. Now, maybe we, they could come back to salvation. I'm not sure what it's really saying here, other than the fact that it says they won't. And it's probably because once they left the glory of God and went back to the world, they will have no desire to come back to God. So the first thing today is let's talk about is that the world revolts. The, our world from the origin until the present has denied and even fought the power of the living God more often than it has obeyed the words of truth. Back in Josiah's day, Josiah was started out as an eight-year-old king, but during his day they found the books of the law in the temple, no less, where else would you find the book of, the, of God but in his church? Well, they found him, and they read him to the people, and they said, are you going to obey? And they said, oh, yeah, we'll obey. Praise God for that word. And the next thing you know, slowly, slowly, they will run away from the word of God. And that's what's happening in America today. That's what's happening in, all around. Remember, some of the early churches were in Turkey and and. Uh, Iran and Iraq, and guess what's happening to those countries today? They are straight Muslim. They have, w they have weaned the church right out of the country. Today, God has not returned, and so as it tells us, is not slow in coming. As some people understand, they're just standing and saying, Boy, your God must be dead. He's not coming back. Well, he's not slow in coming because when he comes, my friends, he's going to dip his robe in the blood of every nation that does not serve him. And those kings that say, I'm going to throw off his feather, fetters, guess what? They will be gone into the hell that they want. But my friends, I thank God that we can stand and say, we shall be with God in glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus tells us that they hate him. That's amazing, isn't it? Here is Jesus, come in a manger, lived 33 and a half years on this earth, did nothing but heal people, did nothing but give us good words, and they hate him. Well, he talks about it in John 15, 24 and 25. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now that they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father, but this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. People today hate God without reason. Some of them still sit in churches today because they will not obey the word of God. They figure if I show up to church, I'll let people know that I know there's a God. Well, there's a difference between knowing there is a God 
and making God your God by obeying his words. We have to give him your life. It's not about I'll show up on Sunday, but it's about giving him your life Monday through Saturday as well. But the religious leaders of that day hated Jesus because the truth would take their power away. If they were to give Jesus the unmitigated glory that he deserves, they would have to give up being all oh, the great rabbis and the great teachers and the great holders of the law because they would have to give up doing it their way and start doing it Jesus' way. What's happening in churches today? Slowly they are moving away because what are they doing? I got to have my opinion about the word. I got to take your opinion about the word and I don't want to upset you because I want you to continue to put into the plate because we want that great amount of money so we can build big buildings and whatever. What I want is people here today that know Jesus Christ is the son of the living God and they'd give their life for Jesus Amen. because Jesus gave his life for you. Amen. How do I know? 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4 tells us, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Is that happening today? Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to miss. My friends, I hope you don't have itching ears because I only got one word to give, and that's the word of God. Amen. And if it hurts, I'm sorry. Maybe you need to scratch the ear a little bit with the word of God. The rulers of this world are nowhere to be found. We find them, we find authorities all over the world. None of them will stand up and say, I am a Christian I believe in Jesus Christ and do his will. So as we see, God sent his son into the world to save sinners. As they must all hear the truth and believe, which is proven by their obedience to the word. You can say you believe, but if you don't obey, you do not believe. If you do not love God and love your fellow man, God says you don't love me if you don't obey. Now, in Acts 4, 24 through 26, it said, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Hasn't he done that? You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his Holy One. Tonight you're going to hear about the glory of Jesus who comes with his garment stained with red because he has stomped the winepress of those that do not believe. And let me tell you, there's a bunch of them. Many pulpits today even attempt to rule out the virgin birth or that Jesus was the son of God. Oh, he was just some good prophet, kind of like Muhammad. You see, Muhammad's still in the grave. But I got news for you. My Jesus, even though his side was pierced with a spear and blood and water ran out, declaring him dead, now lives today at the right hand of God the Father. Amen. He has risen. The tomb is empty, my friend. Now, more than half the world tell us that, oh, no, it's not Jesus Christ, it says. It's Muhammad. It is Allah. Allah is God. I got news for you. Allah is not God because his son didn't come into the world to save the world. His son came in to destroy the world. His son belongs to the lineage of, of, of um, Ishmael. I kept wanting to say Isaac. Ishmael. Word didn't want to come out. But let me tell you, my friends, number two is that God rules. God's in charge. Amen. He has a scepter of power in his hands through the Son. 
God laughs and scoffs at the feeble attempts to cast him out of this world. He laughs because he is God, all-powerful, almighty God. He gets angry at the kings and tells us that he will send his son to redeem the world from them and save those who will believe. What a mighty God. Nothing at all like telling God that you're in charge of your life to get him just a little angry. But when a whole nation says we're going to do it our way, God gets big time angry. And I kind of get the feeling God's a little angry at America today. America has been telling God for the last 20 years that, hey, you're not in charge, we are. Now, a lot of people have put their own God up on Mount Sinai because they're trying to do things their way and they're trying to earn some way into heaven. Mount Sinai stands for the mountain of law. But God says he has instill, installed his son on the holy hill of Mount Zion. Mount Zion stands for grace. And you can't get to the top of the hill with Jesus Christ without first accepting the olive branch that Jesus has given us by grace. God's glory came to earth to give us that grace. An angel cannot sit on the throne of God. God did not say to an angel today, I have made you my son and I have become your father. No, an angel will not do. Why? Because an angel is a created being. They are not, they are basically kind of like a biological. They're created by God. We are created by God. No one can stand or sit on the throne of God because we are created beings. But he tells us in Hebrews 1.5, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son? Today I have become your father, or again I will be his father and he will be my son. He did not say that to an angel. He said it to Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. God did not call any angel because only Zion can establish through the blood. And that blood was given us by a baby in a manger in Bethlehem. And that we have been redeemed by a cross on Calvary and an empty tomb that proves we live forever. Amen. This baby is called the holy arm of the Lord. He is forever foretold in Isaiah as the shoot that will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. Has that happened? Amen. The moment Jesus was born in that stable in Bethlehem, every prophecy of him came through in the Old Testament. I read the other day there was approximately 353 prophecies about Christ. Now, if I had told you tomorrow just two things would happen and they came true, you'd think something was pretty good. But if I told you 353 things that are going to happen tomorrow, you'd think I was crazy or I'd have to be God myself. And God is the only one that can know what happens tomorrow. He knows the beginning from the end, and he has given us the understanding that Jesus Christ is his holy arm, and he instilled him on Mount Zion. What a glorious God we have. We need to stop trying to climb Mount Sinai while we're holding on to Mount Zion. You cannot work your way to heaven. You cannot be good enough to get to heaven. There's only one way you can be right with God to get to heaven, and that is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Through your faith in that blood, you have eternal redemption. Now the only thing you need to do is obey the words of God. To obey them, my friends, you need to read them. Go to the New Testament. I don't want you to just start out in the old. Read the new about two, three times through, and then you can maybe understand the old. But read the New Testament. 
Now, the third thing today is that we must understand that the nations themselves are the inheritance of Jesus Christ. And they will be the inheritance of God himself. During the days of Jesus, from his beginning at Bethlehem through his crucifixion on Golgotha, the scepter, which is the sign of power of life and death, have been taken from Israel and removed into Roman power. And I also think that understanding of the scepter being missing a little bit started when Satan got Eve to eat the tree that she wasn't supposed to eat of. The power now has been removed. There's two, there's a struggle for the power of the people. But Jesus Christ came and won it back. And then according to John 16, 11, guess what? Satan has been condemned. Jesus is in charge of the world. Praise God. Hallelujah. He has the power. Jesus has this power to declare to those who don't believe, depart from me into the depths of hell where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, where there is nothing but fire of sulfur that will burn forever and ever and ever. But he also has the power to look at you and I. If we believe that Jesus is the Christ and believe in him and give him our life, he has the power to open up the gates of, he of heaven wide open and say, come on in, good and faithful servant. What do you want to hear in life? You got two choices. You only got two statements that God's going to give out through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, I've heard it say in hell, no one will say, I'm here unfairly. Because they have been judged by their deeds. Their deeds have been that they do not believe in Jesus. My friends, we are not judged by deeds who are going to heaven. Because we are judged by the grace of Jesus Christ. Now we do deeds because we know Jesus. But we don't do G deeds to know Jesus. Where do you stand? In 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 25, it says, Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God, the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. He must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The blood of Calvary is the dividing line. Right down that cross, there's two sides. There's two crosses on each side of Jesus. One ends up in hell, and the other ends up in heaven. There's only two crosses on each side. Your choice is how you treat the cross in the middle. Your choice is to be like the one who says, Oh, get us down from here. Put us in charge. We, we know you got the power, but I want to be in charge in this world. Get me down from here. I don't want to die. And the other repents, and Jesus says to him, This day you will be with me in paradise. What side? What side of the cross do you want to be on? Which cross do you want to be part of? What a savior we have in Romans 14, 11 through 12. It says, it is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. My friends, every knee is going to bow. Even all those who say Allah is God. They will bow to God. Even though they're not going to end up in heaven, they're going to bow because he's the only one that has the power. They will realize that God is God and that they followed the wrong God. But we, however, will bow and know that as we give an account to God, I have Jesus Christ there as my advocate. He's telling God it's okay. This, the blood covers his sins Hallelujah, my sins have been covered by the blood of Calvary. I 
I often think of the incarnation of Christ, that baby in a manger. Can you imagine God having to have his diapers changed? God having to sup? Maybe he cried, I don't know. Maybe he stuck his finger in his mouth and sucked it like children do. He was human. He left being God, equal with God, to become that baby in a manger. And yet today, he stands and sits at the right hand of God, waiting for God to say, go get him, son. But I know, as a baby, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 and 11, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, and when I became a man... I put childish things behind me. Yet I wonder, and I know for a fact, that he wasn't the same little kid that you and I were. He was much different. For you see, he created the word because he wrote every word down that we read. He also created the world. And so not only had he created it, he knew all about it. He knew how it was created. He knew what was in a man because he has now become man. But he was different because at the age of 12, he could teach the word of God. How many 12-year-olds can even hardly do one scripture today? In Luke 2, 46 through 49, after three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He said. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Don't you know we need to be in our father's house? And yet it's not the house that makes us a church. It's you and me putting our hearts together because you see, we are the temple of God. The Holy Spirit lives within us. And when we come together, we form the church. We got a name on a building, that's okay. But I got a name in my heart. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen? Amen. Now, he felt everything you and I felt and was without sin. He was tempted, it says, in every way. When he saw a box of chocolates, he wanted one. Only kidding. I'm sure they didn't have boxes of chocolates back then, but they probably had chocolate. Everything you and I feel, he felt. And yet, he was the glory of God. As we know from Luke 2, 8 through 14, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. How many of you would be a little terrified at the glory of the Lord showing up here today and and his brightness? You see, he outshines the sun. And here they were in the dark of night being outshined even by the sun. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. And I tell you, do not be afraid of Jesus Christ. Do not be afraid of death. Do not be afraid of anything because Jesus Christ has been born today in Bethlehem and lives today through the cross at God's right hand. He says, I bring you great news, good news of great joy. Isn't it great joy? That will be for all the people. He didn't come just for you and I. He came for every person in the world. Now the difference is, is some of us said yes, and the biggest majority say no. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ. Christ means Messiah. He is Messiah, the Lord. 
Yes, he is Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. His favor rests on every person because God loves everybody. For God so loved the world. Now, he loves us especially because he loves us because we love him back. But yet the person out there that doesn't love him, he still loves that person. He wants that person to come to the knowledge of him. When you see people out there that you know are doing wrong, do not turn away from them, but give them the word of God even if they don't like you. The thing is, God loves them, and you got to love them. You don't have to like what they do, but you got to love the person. So today he came in a manger promising you one thing. He promised you eternal life. Now, like I said, which cross are you on today? Are you on the cross that says, depart from me? Or on the cross that says, today you'll be with me in paradise? You got to know. How do you know? You know in your heart as the team comes to sing. You know in your heart that Jesus is there. As he tells us in Ephesians that the Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing our salvation. When you come to Jesus Christ and you give him your life and you obey him, how do you obey him? First, you obey him by giving him your faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You give him your faith. We're saved by faith from first to last. Then, my friends, you prove that faith. By first confession to the people around us that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then we repent of our old life because you can't live like you were and continue to love God. That's one of the requirements is to turn around your life and to live for Jesus. And then you need to pledge a good conscience towards God because you know your sins have been forgiven. You immerse yourselves into the watery grave of baptism to wash those sins away. Now all those are obediences. You don't do them because you want to be saved. You do them because you are. And if you don't do them, then you're not. Now, if you can't do them, that's a whole different problem. But I give you today, there's only one way. He let, he's born in a manger, died on a cross. And proves who he is by an empty tomb. You're going to give him your life today? If you haven't, today's the day as we sing. And if you need special prayer, you want someone to come and pray with you, maybe you just want to rededicate your life, or want to pray for somebody, raise your hand. The elders will come and pray with you where you are. They don't want you to come forward. Maybe you might be embarrassed to come forward. Just raise your hand. They'll come and have a special prayer with you. But don't leave here today without knowing that you're going to heaven. Because there is, there might not be a tomorrow. I'm talking in the back. That old <laughs> saying I've got. People wait till the 11th hour to be saved and they die at 1030. What happens? They end up in hell. So stand up today. Let us sing. <laughs>